Well, good morning once again. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Steve Presser, and normally I'm over on this side with a guitar in hand and leading you in worship as the church's uh, director of worship, but since Pastor Craig is away, um, I've been given the nod to present today's message to you, so I appreciate the opportunity, and it's always a, a privilege and a, pleasure, and a pleasure to do so. And so um, welcome here if you are new. I'd love to get the chance to meet you. And um, we're going to get into part two today of our sermon series on worship. And so what we've been doing is last week we talked about the things that we give to God as we worship Him. Today we're going to be looking at what does God give to us as we worship Him. And in the coming two weeks we're going to look at getting real with worship. So in other words, what happens when you've worshipped the Lord for years and years and maybe even decades? You know, when, sometimes when we go through... Uh, the same routines, it can become just that. It becomes routine, it becomes habit, or maybe even duty. And so how do we break that cycle to keep the freshness of God in our minds? And then finally, we're going to look at, well, how do we worship both independently as individuals, but also corporately as we're doing here today? And what is the purpose? What is the value of doing both? So today, uh, just in terms of remembering from last week what we talked about, we talked about what what we give to God. And so Pastor talked about gratitude. We give God our gratitude when we come to worship Him. We offer Him our thanks, and we offer Him our praise. We also talked about humility and that we were giving of God our honesty as we go before Him and admit our shortcomings, our failures, and our sins, and confess that to Him. And then he also talked about attention. We give God attention because He is worthy of it. That very word worship means that you are worthy. You are worth our, our praise and the fixation of our eyes on him. And so I find it interesting that um, we're going to look at Psalm 100 here in a moment. All throughout Scripture, God commands us to worship him. And I find that interesting because all of Scripture is God-breathed. It is his divine and inspired word written down uh, for us and for our benefit. And so just to give you one example, I'm going to turn to Psalm 100, and it says this. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. And we surely did that. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to his name, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Now why would an all-perfect God, who needs nothing, why would he command us to worship him? Have you ever thought of that? Why would God command us to worship him? If God is love, and I believe he is, then the most loving thing that he could do is to command us to look to him. Is to command us to trust him. To command us to continue to look to him. So I have a four-year-old. My four-year-old son, from time to time, I can hear myself saying the same things over and over again to him. I'll say, Everett, listen to daddy. Everett, don't go here or don't do that because it will hurt you. Everett, come back, right? All right, so turn that vertical now. What is God asking of his children, you and I? He's saying, Steve, listen to me. I know what's best for you. Steve, look at me. I've been there, done that. I know what's best for you. Steve, turn around, right? And we can hear that same thing. The scripture tells us that you who are evil, if you know how to, good, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more then does God give good gifts to those who know him? Right? And so we can see this, that the best and loving thing God can do is to command us to worship him, to look to him, to honor him, to be, he is the person we look to for our guidance. He is the person we look to because he is absolutely worthy of it. And so um, I have this sentence that if you're taking notes, I'd like for you to try to write this down, but it's going to serve as this banner over today's message. 
as we talk about what does God give to us in worship, which really is more of himself, here it is. When we worship, God reminds us of his goodness and faithfulness. He transforms us into his likeness. And he comforts the soul of all who long for his appearing. So if you're making notes, I'm going to read that one more time for you. When we worship, God reminds us of his goodness and faithfulness. He transforms us into his likeness. And he comforts the soul who longs for his appearing. So when we worship, we are reminded, reminded. You know, I'm so glad we sang that song, God of Our Yesterdays, because we will fix our eyes on you. You are the God who was, who is, and is to come, right? We thank you, God of our yesterdays. Why is it so important that we remember? It's important because we're so prone to forgetting. We're prone to forgetting. And, and worse yet, when we forget, we then begin to ignore. And when we begin to ignore, we then start to abandon. And I'm sure many of you have a relative or a close friend who at one point in time maybe grew up in church or was close to the Lord, and you've seen them start to wander. That's why I like that hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, right? And so they start to wander, and so it's important to remember. So when John was receiving his revelation from the Lord and he was writing down to the several churches, one of the churches that he wrote to in Revelation 2, he writes this, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. In other words, you're doing a great job doing a lot of good, great things. But I have this one thing against you, that you have abandoned your first love, so therefore remember from where you have fallen. Remember. Repent and do the works that you did at first. Right? So what's God doing? He's calling us once again <clears throat> excuse me, to remember. The other day I was at home and um, we're cleaning out a few drawers and I remembered I had some files that were likely on a thumb drive that was upstairs, so I asked Samantha to get it for me. And so I get this thumb drive back, and I'm looking through, and there was some old, old stuff on this thumb drive, old stuff, uh, the best of which was a lot of pictures. And so if you're friends with me on Facebook, you likely saw a few of those pictures because they were pictures from my deployment um, to Iraq back in 2006. And it just reminded me, as I'm looking through pictures of that deployment, I'm finding pictures also of Samantha and I from when we first, were, uh, we first met, a couple of um, balls that we went to, and pictures of us in our 20s, and now we're in our mid-30s, and just looking back over those 15, 16 years now, and it just brought a lot of great memories to mind. It's important to remember. Those of you who are here who are married, or maybe you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, oftentimes on your anniversaries, you'll go out to celebrate, and you'll remember right? You'll rekindle that first love that we talked about. It's important to have those anniversaries and to have times of remembering. And that's why the psalmist wrote in Psalm 77, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old, right? So the Old Testament instructs us in various ways to remember. And I get giddy about this kind of stuff, and I want to teach it to you today is there's so much that God did in the Old Testament to remember, so many works and wonders. But God had instructed, if you look in Leviticus 23, he had instructed them to have several feasts and festivals by way to remember what God had done. And what I like about these feasts and festivals is that each of them, while they didn't know it at the time, each of them point to Christ. And so quickly, I want to go through them, and I encourage you to go and do some homework later and do a little bit of studying to maybe find out some more about these. But I'm quickly going to tell you what, it, what, what it, the purpose was, and then it, it's, it's pointing to Christ's uh, meaning. So the first and the biggest one is Passover. So Passover, if you recall, when the Israelites were in Egypt and they were slaves, they were getting ready to be freed. And the final and tenth plague that came on the land was um, the plague of the firstborn. That death angel was going to come through. But the promise was is that if that family had the blood of the lamb put over the doorposts of their home, that the angel would literally pass over them. So looking forward now into the New Testament, what do we see? We see that the blood of Christ, the perfect lamb of God, was slain for us, and that by faith in him, we have literally put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of our hearts. Amen. So that whenever 
that day comes, that day of the Lord, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, when that day comes, we too will be passed over in terms of judgment. And God will look on the blood, and he will pass over us and save us. The second one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this was a seven-day feast following Passover, and it was intended to remember the hardships in Egypt. And if you recall, they had to flee in haste. And so there wasn't a whole lot for them to do in terms of cooking. There was no leaven in the house. They fleed in haste. When you look at the New Testament, what is one of the things Jesus said? He had a lot of great I am sayings. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What did he also say? He also said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He is the one who sustains us. So you may not have everything that you want, but we do have everything that we need in Christ Jesus, just as the Israelites had when they were fleeing from Egypt in those days. Another one that we don't talk about much is the Feast of First Fruits. So the Feast of First Fruits, it was a feast of thanksgiving to God's provision as they were going into the land. It was celebrated the, the day after the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So why is that so important? It's important because God's timing is absolutely perfect. If you think of the Easter story, they celebrated the Passover. And then the day after the Sabbath, which was a Saturday, the day after the Sabbath would have been a Sunday, the Feast of first fruits. And what did Paul write to the Corinthians? He said that Christ Jesus was the first fruits from the dead. He was the first one, right? So the, the timing is so incredible, so perfect. It's not like it was just some random coincidence. So many things were perfectly timed up in Jesus' death. Another feast, the fourth one, was the Feast of Weeks, or we might refer to it as Pentecost. And this feast occurred seven weeks or 50 days following the Feast of first fruits, right? And it was a time for them to come and to bring of the harvest a little bit um, and as a way of celebration. Well, if you look in the New Testament, book of Acts, you'll see that Peter preached and converted 3,000 on one day and that the Holy Spirit came in and rested on the disciples at Pentecost. At Pentecost. And what's unique about that is part of the offerings that were brought was two leavened loaves. And you often see Paul, the apostle, writing about Jew and Gentile. Two loaves, now grafted into one salvation. Another one is the Feast of Trumpets. So much like the Sabbath day, the Feast of Trumpets was a solemn day of rest. A solemn day of rest. And it was proclaimed with the blasting of a horn with a feast to follow. So keep that in mind. The blasting of a horn with a feast to follow. What do we read in the New Testament? We read that when the Lord comes, there will be the sound of trumpets and the horn will blow. And then we too will enter into an eternal rest celebrated with a great feast. The Day of Atonement was a day where the, um, the folks came together to humble themselves and to make restitution for, for all of their wrongs that were committed. It, the Day of Atonement was a day to remember depravity and sinfulness. And in part of all their sacrifices, one of the things that was to happen as well is that the prayers would come, and on this goat, hands were laid on the goat, and it would symbolize all the sins of the nation. And this goat was then sent out of the city, left on its own devices, likely to die, of course. And so what do we see in the New Testament with Jesus? We see that, again, Jesus, the Lamb of God, perfect and sinless, it was he who took on our sin, bared the weight of our sin on his shoulders, and they led him out of the city to be slain. And so there's so many symbolic pictures along the way as each of these points to Christ. And the last one then is the Feast of Tabernacles where if you remember when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, the tabernacle, the worship place, dwelled with them as they made their way. And so God was with them, right? And now we see in the New Testament that we are given the Holy Spirit that lives within us as believers in Christ Jesus. So now God once again tabernacles with us. And God brings these seven different things into mind to remember, to remember all the good things that he did, how he provided for you in the desert, how he 
um, skipped and passed over you on the day, that tenth and final plague. All of these wonderful miracles. Now in the New Testament, when we come to worship, we often celebrate two church ordinances. One of them being baptism. And so we read in Romans 6, 4, that we were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a newness of life. Baptism serves in many ways, but one of the ways that it gives us is a picture. We identify with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection when we undergo these baptismal waters over here. That when a believer comes and professes Christ as their Savior, that that believer then, as a first step in obedience, says, I will be baptized. And as they go under the water, it's as if they're dying as he did, put in the tomb, and raised to walk in a new life, a life that honors God. And so it's a way for the believer then to proclaim their faith, but it's a way for us as the congregation and the witnesses around for us to remember It's a way for us, too, to remember our own faith, perhaps, if you were baptized. And you can recall that day when you said yes to the Lord. And then maybe days, weeks, or months later, you followed that up in baptism, perhaps, to to make a declaration before many that you are his. Another way that we remember is through communion. So if you were here last week, we celebrated together the Lord's Supper. And oftentimes when we facilitate communion, we're reminded of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So two, two things, well, three things really happen during communion. Number one is we remember. We remember. The second is we're actively worshiping. And the third is, is we're making a proclamation of something to come. We're putting our hope in something that Jesus promised, that he will come again. Isn't that amazing? Because so often we look at communion as a somber time, a reflective time, a time where... Um, You know, we're supposed to get right with the Lord, and obviously that's very true, that we pour out our sin before him, and we're in humble thanksgiving for what he's done by giving us of his blood. But it can also be a time of celebration, because in partaking of communion, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and that will be a joyful time. So we get to remember. That's the big one. Number two, when we worship God, he conforms or transforms us into the likeness of Christ. When we come together and we worship, we're being transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that's why we put all these uh, spiritual disciplines and we encourage them for you, whether it's prayer, worship, fasting, coming together in corporate worship. All these things are meant and designed to grow you and to nurture you in faith so that God can transform you. So a good number of months ago, I had the privilege of speaking to you then And um, I said this, I said that your thoughts will drive your actions, right? Your thoughts will drive your actions. Your actions will develop into habits. Your habits will then define your character. And your character then directs your lifestyle. So you catch that? Your thoughts will lead to your actions. Your actions will lead to your habits. Your habits will lead to your character. And your character will determines your lifestyle. So one of the things that we're told is, that we, when we come together, we're told that we are to renew our mind. Renew your mind, your way of thinking, and what you think and dwell on. So in Philippians 4.8, I love this passage. Paul writes, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things, because what do we know? We know that garbage in is garbage out. So think about these things. I hope for my son, who's four, that this will be one of the very first scriptures he can memorize fully, uh, maybe a year, maybe even now. But um, I want him to know this so well. 
is to think about these things. Because when the day comes when he starts to, well, he's already done it. He, when he back talks me or back talks his mom or says something that we don't want to hear, I want to be able to look him in the face and say, now, Everett, was that true? Was that lovely, what you just said? Was that honorable, the way that you were speaking about this person or that? Was it praiseworthy? Was there any excellence in telling me that story that you just told me? And some of you are probably thinking right now, man, I'm hearing stories all over the place when I'm at my workplace and gossip happens and this and that and talking bad about family and wow, we can really get in a swirl of negativity. And what Paul is writing to them to say is, no, man, keep it all good, clean, and pure. Why? The things that you think about and the dwell on, the things that you listen, the TV you watch, the music that you listen to, all of that stuff, when you dwell on that, where you spend your time and energy, that's going to pour out from you. That's where you're likely to take action is in all the things that you're taking in. Your life will continue to move in the direction of your strongest thoughts. So not only do we renew our minds, but we also protect our hearts. So Proverbs 4.23, Above all, guard your heart, for from it flows the wellspring of life. The heart and the mind are so deeply connected when you read Scripture. They're so deeply connected, and I, I love this analogy, and maybe one day I'll get around to writing a book. I'll just call it Coffee Pot Theology. Um, but think about a standard coffee pot. A standard coffee pot has the basket on the top, and inside that basket, we put a filter, and then inside that filter, we put our coffee grinds. He knows what I'm talking about. So, we fill it up with water, and underneath is our carafe, right? And in that carafe, we want pure coffee. We don't want it to be unfiltered. We want pure coffee. We don't want grinds. We don't want dirt. We just want pure, perfect coffee. The basket is your mind. The filter is the word of God. The carafe is your heart. So what you put into your mind, we need to make sure that we filter out correctly so that we get the pure substance in our hearts. Because when we don't, we get dirty coffee. When we don't, we get hearts that are tainted. And that's why in the scripture, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul writes that we take every thought captive and we make it obedient to Christ. So this process that we're undergoing as we come into worship and we read his word, we keep pouring in good and we keep filtering that good by the scripture. Why do we do that? We do that so that we can renew our minds and protect and guard our hearts. And we do that because God commands it. He commands us to do this. So, he sets us apart. 2 Corinthians 3.18, We all, with an unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. I love this new background that we put up. And um, after we did this on Wednesday, our percussionist, Mark, he sent me a text and he says, um, you know, I think I have a name for your project, and it's called Broken Pieces. And I'm like, ooh, I like that. I like that. Why? Because we who are made in the image of God are broken pieces. But God still commands us to worship him. God still commands us, as you see, to reflect him. As broken as we are, we're still commanded to reflect him to the world around us until he completely makes us new on that day. But we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is spirit. And then again in 1 Peter 1, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Right? So some of us, maybe we are finding ourselves in kind of a lull in our faith. Maybe you came to the Lord a good number of years ago, and you just kind of been business as usual, and, and maybe you found yourself sliding away, or maybe your life isn't as holy as you'd like it to be right now, because... Unfortunately, we've allowed ourselves to be conformed again to the way of the world, that same world that we said we were leaving behind when we trusted Christ. And so Peter says, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the, the passions of your former ignorance. But he, as he who called you is holy, be also holy in all of your conduct. 
So there's a nice big word in church settings that we use. That word is sanctify. And simply put, it just means to set apart. We're, we're called to set ourselves apart, right? To sanctify yourselves. The children of Israel were often told, sanctify yourselves this day. Set yourself apart. And so we're called to do the same. And there's a process of this. It happens in three ways. We are, as believers, we are set apart when we believe and trust in Christ, right? That's what he's saying here. Don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. No, you have set apart yourself, so make sure you stay set apart. But as we continue to grow in faith and as the years go on, we are continuously being sanctified as we're growing and being nurtured in Christ Jesus. And then we're longing for that day to come when we will fully be sanctified. We will fully be set apart with him in glory. And so I'm looking forward to that. And I pray that each of you are growing in your own holiness and being sanctified and set apart continually as you worship and as the years go by. Because the third thing is, is that when we worship, God comforts our soul as we long for his appearing. He comforts our soul. The Lord is coming back again. Amen? Amen. So when we say that, usually we get three responses. The three responses we get is we usually get applause, right? So people are joyful and we have a, an anticipation of this. Believers do. When you say the Lord's coming back to others, if they don't know him, sometimes we get scoffers, people who pick at the Lord, who dismiss the Lord. And then the third type is you get those who are maybe somewhere in between. And so that might be a wayward believer, a cultural Christian, if I can use that term, maybe someone who grew up in church uh, or maybe was baptized into the church and never to return again, but their family in an effort to claim the faith of some sort, I'm a Christian. Okay, I understand that. Maybe you're a struggling Christian. Maybe you're just filled with doubts. Maybe you're going through hard times and you're wondering where is God and all this, all this hardship. And so it makes it that much easier then to want to walk away and to, to doubt and to distrust the Lord. Or maybe you're just an unsure seeker. But in all these things, we get, um, we get some people who are in between. When we worship God, he comforts the souls of those who long for his appearing. So I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you have it, to 2 Peter chapter 3. As we start to kind of wrap things up, we're going to look at a few verses here. Peter starts off, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you. Second letter. Beloved, and in both of them, I'm stirring you up in sincere mind by way of what? Reminder. I'm trying to remind you. You know, some of you younger ones, your parents tell you over and over again to do something. They're reminding you. It's for your benefit, most likely. It's not just to nag you. It's for your good. To stir up your mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your, through your apostles. In other words, look back to what they have said. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. So, keep in mind this. When Peter wrote these words, it was only a good handful of years in comparison to where we are in history from the resurrection of Christ. And the scoffers were coming, and they were going to be saying, where is this Jesus again? Here we are now in 2020, and scoffers still continue to come, and you know them. They're in your workplaces. They're your neighbors, and they look and they say, well, why are all these people on their face year and year and year after year claiming that Jesus is coming back, claiming that God is real, when all we see is the same old thing? Well, the scoffers have been saying that for years. But look what, look what he writes. They do this following their own sinful desires. People dismiss the Lord because they choose to follow their own sinful desires. They don't want to be held accountable for anything. And so it's easier to dismiss him. And they will say, where is the promise of this coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. 
And so they look to you and they say, nothing's changed. It's just science, right? It's just science, just the way that it is. They deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. So if you go back to the creation story, the earth is four-fifths water. And God formed everything, separating the waters above from the waters beneath. So what is he saying in here? He's saying, don't forget the beginning when God formed everything with water. Don't forget the beginning when God did a miraculous creating event that a lot of people want to dismiss and say it was caused by some other cause. Don't forget that. And that by means of the same, the world would then be, the world existed and was deluged with water and perished. So not only did God create using mostly water, and we see that water coming into play, but God also judged in the flood using water. And I would encourage you to do some research on the matter because one of my favorite classes was a creation class uh, in my undergrad. And there was so much evidence and arguments made for what happens with a global flood. How do you get animals that presumably would only have existed in one area, how do they show up in rock layers deep beneath the earth all the way on the other side of the world, if not for a global flood? And so God has ways of showing us his truth. The evidence is there. And so he's saying these people, they have willingly forgotten the creation. They have willingly forgotten the flood. And in so doing, look what happens. But by the same word, in other words, the word of God that spoke this earth into existence, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So God's going to do another incredible, miraculous event on the day of the Lord. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. So all of you who are scoffing the Lord, who say, where is this God of yours? He has yet to show up. Be warned. Be warned. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done will be exposed. God's going to do another incredible thing in the future, and it's not meant to scare you. It is meant to draw you near to him because God's long-suffering, the Greek word there is two words put together. It means long fuse. He's got a long fuse. But we know that when that fuse runs out, he's given us several examples of what happens. When the patience of God runs out, it usually comes in a violent or dramatic event. Some of those events included the flood. Another event included 40 years of wandering in the desert. And another event yet to come is that day of the Lord. You know, we say all this because when we start believing the reality of the other side, the things that God has said would come, when we start believing the reality of what's to come, we will start living and behaving in light of that reality here and now. I think for many of us, we too have grown into this trap where Years go by. Generations have gone by. And maybe we haven't seen dramatic change. And so doubts creep in. And we wonder, where is this God? Because we're a fickle people. And we need reminding. We're restless. And we need peace. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to do with the disciples. It was when he was with them. Let's look at John 14, 26 and 28. He writes them and he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you I am going away, and I will come to you. 
And if you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. What's he saying? He's saying that the disciples were fearful of Jesus leaving because the security of their faith wasn't grounded the same way that security and faith was grounded between the Father and the Son. But Jesus is saying, I am going to give you something not as the world gives, because the world gives in terms of circumstantial, right? Peace in terms of world, worldly things is so circumstantial. Some of us have peace because we have money. Some of us have peace because we have a place to go to at night. Some of us have peace because we're in a better neighborhood than maybe we once were. Some of us have peace because our family is put together. Whatever the circumstance may be, that's a false sense of peace. And what Jesus is saying is, I am giving you a different peace, not as the world gives. And that's why he repeats it again later in John 16, just two chapters later, because as he's getting ready to go to the cross, he's teaching a flood of information to the disciples. And what does he say in John 16? He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. You may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. In the world, you will have bad circumstances. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So what is this peace? It is a secured faith. It's a secured faith not to doubt what's coming ahead. It's a secured faith knowing that the promises of God are true. It's, it's the reminding that God was doing so much in the past that he asks us to have feasts and festivals, throw a party, remember. And that God continuously helps us to grow even now as we worship him to become more like him. And that in the future, that day the Lord is going to come and it will come suddenly and we are called to be prepared and called to make sure others are prepared also. But the peace that he gives is that peace that surpasses all understandings, which what is to guard your heart, and your mind. Remember. Remember. He who was faithful in the past will continue to be faithful now and in the future. And so we'll close with Hebrews 10.23. This is my prayer for you. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we indeed are grateful, and um, as we sit here in your house of worship, we've lifted up songs this morning that declare your goodness, your providence, your holiness. We have praised you for the things that you have done in the past. We marvel at how you're currently at work in our lives, even this day, and we are encouraged, Lord, to look forward to the day to come. We thank you, God, that you are patient with us, that you endure with us. And we would pray salvation over anyone who does not know you. Lord, you came to this earth, you lived and suffered, died for us. You are our scapegoat. Each of us created in your image of us asked to, to know you, to look to you because you're good. Each of us have turned, however, to his own way. Some of us here today have still chosen our own way. In light of your truth, in light of your, the evidence. So I would pray that, Lord, you would break through those walls. direct access. It's Jesus who's our high priest, no one else. And then you would give us peace. Peace that our circumstances may not be the best. Or maybe you humble us, God, that despite our wonderful circumstances, there is a greater peace to be had. 
Lord, bless each and every family represented here today. Would you stir our hearts to live for you, to go about your business, to reach the world around us as we've been so fortunate to be reached ourselves. May you be praised in this house. 